I met Bjarke for the very first time in the Venice Biennale, and I encourage everybody to go to those opening days in the Venice Biennale. It's a great time to meet uh, sort of a lot of architects in one place. And he, he basically said, come look me up. And, uh, and I did. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Creative Insider Podcast. Today's guest is Kai-Uwe Bergman, one of a longtime partners at Björk Ingels Group, BIG, which is one of the biggest and most cutting edge architecture offices in the world. We talk about many topics, about how he joined, how he met Björk Ingels, how you can join the office and how the office has grown so much in the last few years. So I suggest you to stay along the full conversation to take away all the possible learnings you can. Before we start, I want to remind you that it would be great if you can support the podcast by subscribing to the channel, liking the video to help the algorithm, and of course, resharing it with other friends that might enjoy it. Also, I want to remind you that if you want, you can also watch all the podcasts live and participate in the live Q&A chat just by signing up for our Patreon group. You will find the link in the description. Thank you very much and enjoy the conversation with Kai-Uwe Bergman. Hello, Kai. How are you? Uh, great, Georgi, and uh, looking forward to... Uh, so this has been many, many months in, uh, in preparation. Yeah, since uh, we met twice already, once in New York, once in Frankfurt, I know you have a very busy schedule. So first of all, I want to thank you very, very much for your time. Um, and uh, I, let's discover who is Kai Uwe Bergman. So I'm, I'm very curious, uh, why did you decide to become an architect? And I know... I, indirectly that you have a very international background between Denmark, the US, Germany. So if you can briefly <laughs> explain that. Yes, I, I think as with so many others, it probably started with a set of Legos um, and uh, being able to uh, sort of build these uh, fantastical worlds, uh, you know, with just, you know, a common brick. And um, then I think if you add also my parents uh, at a very early age uh, traveled in, to many different places with me. And um, in those travels, I would always be uh, going inside cathedrals and castles and uh, looking at public markets. Um, and so I would find these kind of almost uh, communal spaces and, and cathedral-like spaces uh, as so awe-inspiring. So from that very moment, I was trying to think of how could I uh, be involved in the creation of these kinds of spaces. And so even as a teenager, I very quickly uh, discovered uh, architecture and what an architect does and throughout my high school. And then uh, as soon as I could, uh, attended college, uh, started working in the summers for architects, um, and that's how I uh, I sort of started into the profession. That sounds very interesting. It's a it's a very interesting that you were impressed by those castles, uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I started with Lego too. But that's uh, more, more or less the the common ground. And and you studied also in the U.S. right because you're licensed in the U.S. So how come you move from from Europe to the U.S.? Yeah, so I I am German by birth. Um, my family um, did uh, sort of wander off. Uh, in uh, in my mom's generation and my dad's generation, they went to other, uh, discovered other parts of the world. And so I do have family in Scandinavia and Sweden and Sydney, Australia, and uh, many parts of Europe and also in the United States. So we immigrated to the United States in 1976. Uh, we actually came across uh, the Atlantic on the QE2 uh, and my first site uh, or sighting of the United States was the Statue of Liberty standing on the top deck of the QE2, Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, and then that ship actually docked at the Chelsea Piers on the west side. Um, and uh, some family members came to pick us up and uh, took us to their home in Connecticut. 
So um, from that moment on, really uh, from 76, America um, has been my home. And uh, I have, um, you know, both uh, taken all my schooling, high school and universities here. I, uh, I did attend uh, University of Virginia for my undergraduate and the University of California, Los Angeles for my graduate. That was to just sort of enjoy the two coasts, East Coast and West Coast, very different mentalities. Um, and once I finished six years of my education, I felt really that I had not yet uh, worked or done anything. Um, I could theorize and I could kind of uh, talk a lot about architecture, but I wasn't necessarily making or doing it. So I set forth on a sort of three-year apprenticeship where I apprenticed as a stonemason, as a carpenter, uh, as a glassblower, uh, to really understand and get a, a feel for all the materials that uh, that are architecture. That's um, that's um, also very, very cool because here in Germany you're kind of like uh, you have to do it. You have to do an apprentice and in, in the, on the construction site while you're studying. So it's uh, very important, in my opinion, too, to have this um, understanding of what is the construction site and the materials and how things um, are built. And in this whole story, when did you join uh, the architectural world and how did you join BIG? Because you're one of maybe the earlier BIGsters or did you join already along the the, the way? Yeah, so... Um, it was actually a German author, Hermann Hesse, who wrote uh, Narcissus and Goldmund, um, where I learned about Auf der Walz. It's the German uh, kind of uh, thought of a journeyman architect. And um, so once I completed uh, all of these different apprenticeships, um, I then actually settled in Seattle for a number of years, and I started my architectural uh, life there uh, with a smaller regional office, but very sort of modern in language, called uh, Ed Weinstein or Weinstein Copeland, and um, and that was a really good start. Um, a great mentor uh, and and still a, a very important office in the in the Seattle area. Um, I did have a German passport, and I had done all of these travels, so I was still itching to uh, actually go to Europe and to try to do architecture and practice architecture there. So I, I took my portfolio in a backpack and I set forth. Um, I interviewed for about three months in about six different countries. And um, they, the place that I actually did discover and found work, that was in, um, in Vorarlberg, which is in Austria. And I worked for a couple of years at Baumschlager and Eberle Architects. Uh, some of you might uh, know them. And um, those were some great years because, uh, you know, they were known as Baukünstler or uh, sort of uh, architect craftsmen. And uh, they had this love of material and love of making that I also shared. So I worked there for a couple of years. And then uh, it was actually love that uh, sent me up north to Scandinavia, um, and I moved to Copenhagen uh, in 2004, um, where I then uh, basically was looking for work, and there were very few offices at that time that were kind of doing work outside of Denmark. Um, I also, of course, needed to learn Danish, the language, in order to even uh, be uh, productive. And so those first couple of years, I learned the language. Uh, I met Bjarke for the very first time in the Venice Biennale. And I encourage everybody to go to those opening days in the Venice Biennale. It's a great time to meet uh, sort of a lot of architects in one place. And he, he basically said, come look me up. And, uh, and I did. Oh, that's that's so cool, and it's so funny because you said you work for this uh, craftsman's architect, and that's also kind of connected to your latest book uh, in big uh, form giving. Uh, so <laughs> it's kind of like a, a a recurring topic. Um, 
And uh, how were, how did Big evolve since then till now? Because I imagine that in 2004, was it already Big or was it still Plot? And you've seen this major evolution. How did you handle it um, along the along the journey, let's say? Sure. So I actually officially started at Big in 2006. Um, I spent a year and a half or so just uh, sort of studying the language and uh, and, and working um, uh, to, uh, to finally get to the point of uh, seeing Bjarke and, um, and joining. And at that time, Bjarke had just opened up big a few months. Um, Plot had been uh, from 2001 to 2005. He and Julien had, of course, shared uh, Plot. But by the time I started, I think there were probably about 30 people uh, mostly Danes, uh, just a, a few uh, foreigners. And um, we were working on almost all projects exclusively in Denmark and even as close as just within the 100 kilometers of, of Copenhagen. Um, and I started off as an architect. I worked on a couple of projects, uh, both as support and also as project leader. Um, and uh, it was kind of evident to me uh, that one of the things that I could contribute to, uh, to Big and to Bjarke was my foreign experience of working in different countries. And my, I was also a licensed architect in America, so I could also look for work and, and you know, do full service uh, of work in the United States. So um, very early on in the first couple of years, I had expressed to Bjarke the the real desire to kind of not only work on projects, but also to look for them, find them, uh, hunt for them. And so um, I think Bjarke did see that uh, that sort of skill set and, and really supported it. Um, and so I delved more and more into the business uh, uh, side of things, uh, both uh, client management, uh, contractual uh, kind of discussions and, um, and, and really assembling teams, finding the collaborators uh, that would make uh, work really successful. Um, and then, you know, um, one of the most major things happened, which is the financial crisis. And uh, suddenly all of the work that we were working on in Denmark um, and in Iceland suddenly stopped. And uh, we had to start looking for work in a lot of different places. Yeah, that's and and that's the million dollar question actually in architecture. What are the skill sets you need to to hunt clients and to land one? Because I <laughs> mean, you're what some sort of the. I mean, I see I see you as a one of the frontmen of big because uh, I mean, I guess there are a lot of partners at the company, but um, certain people are maybe more extrovert and we see them more often, and some others. Uh, maybe not so much, but um, is that also your major soft skill that you're very good with people? Because also you said you can build a team, and um, yeah, I'm curious what are the skill sets that are required, and what is the method that you use to to land the projects? Uh, the million dollar question, right, uh, Georgi? So. Um, I actually think I started in this way uh, because I'm an only child. And when you're an only child, you don't have anyone, uh, in, in essence, to, uh, to, to have fun with or to play with. And so uh, very early on, I would just go out into a neighborhood and start knocking on doors, uh, whether I knew that they had children in there or not. And I would just ask, uh, are there any children in that house? And then if they said yes, I would say, do they have time to play? Uh, and, and from that moment on, I think I, I was just on a path, on a journey to, uh, to continuously knock on doors, to continuously to develop uh, relationships. And, you know, for, for, I think for, for Big and for myself personally, this, nothing is business. Um, and, and nothing is, I, I generally don't use words like marketing or promotion uh, because it, it's just about really making work and making and working on things that are some of the biggest challenges that we have uh, in humanity and, and solving or at least contributing to solving 
some of those challenges. And um, it's, it, it is just, uh, you know, telling the stories, it's uh, creating the narratives and, um, and in many ways connecting the people that can make these things happen. And so that, that to me is, it, if, if that's called business development, then that's what it is. But uh, to me, it, it's something that is just so inherent uh, in how we go about, um, you know, looking for things and uh, both proactively, uh, but also, you know, dealing with things as they arise. Uh, so it, it's very much just a, a kind of um, um, an attitude. No, but in, in the case of Big, I think the marketing, it's like the projects itself because they're all so particular and interesting and they're built through a story. Um, so the way they're designed, it's built through a process, a mental process that creates the story. So I think that uh, they're very self, um, self-explanatory self in a, in a way and... Uh, I mean, you often present them and also there are plenty of um, videos out there of Bjorke presenting the project. So, um, so yeah. And, and you mentioned this uh, going out for, for more work in other areas in the world. Uh, one thing is that through different cultures and through different continents, there are also different tastes, so to say, um, so how do you guys at Big manage to be relevant uh, in China, in America, in Europe? Uh, what is your approach to match what is the need of the, of the client that you guys have? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it, it's um, so when, when that happened, the, the financial crisis um, and we needed to deal with it in 2008, um, I, I would say that, you know, that, again, many people would probably uh, deal with any kind of a crisis, say the, the, the pandemic crisis that we've just all been through or, or the current economic challenges and perhaps uh, in a way look for all of the things that aren't happening or that, you know, you focus on the difficulties. And I believe one of the ways uh, that Bjarke really tried to approach Uh, the act of design is very much yes is more that you can actually also approach challenges with a positive attitude and you could look for ways to uh, leverage the effort uh, into finding uh, ways that bring people together. And so we actually grew as an office uh, between 2008 and 2010 when many places actually retracted or laid people off. And, and I felt that what, what was happening was that we were, in a way, going out and connecting with uh, different cultures, different societies, and we were trying to find those bridges. Um, one great example is uh, we were traveling in Azerbaijan, and um, what we didn't know is that 100 years before us, the Nobel uh, brothers... Uh, were traveling through uh, Azerbaijan and um, actually discovered uh, oil and were in many ways uh, responsible for the first oil well, the first oil ship for transportation, um, and, and figuring out how to commodify uh, this natural resource. And instead of just taking all of the money and pouring it back into Sweden or taking it out of the country, they instead invested it into the first hospitals, the first uh, kindergartens, uh, and the first sort of uh, public amenities that, that uh, Baku and Azerbaijan had seen. And so uh, there's also a beautiful promenade around the bay in Baku, and that's also uh, a legacy of the Nobel family. So when you, when, you know, 100 years go by, And uh, we show up and we tell everyone that we're from Scandinavia. Uh, their memory is of uh, Scandinavians, uh, the Nobel family, as, wow, that's good. There's, there's actually um, a lot of good that came out of uh, the time that they spent here. 
And, and so suddenly we were associated simply by the fact of being from Scandinavia as uh, actually doing good and thinking of the collective as opposed to the individual. And, and so they really wanted us to re-engage with a kind of public uh, process, looking at the promenade, uh, how to add to it, uh, and to do uh, different projects all around Azerbaijan. Um, I thought this was a, a, an interesting way that, you know, you, you don't quite know um, how history uh, might uh, have happened and, and how you relate to that history. Uh, it also begs that you really need to understand a place uh, and, and do the research and to, and to truly understand the cultural kind of DNA of, of places. Um, it also helps that big really is representative um, of so many countries. We have over, I think, uh, 40 countries represented in our, in our staff. And so we have a representative from so many different places that also serve to build those bridges um, and, and to understand the, the cultural nuances from, from place to place. And what is like the creative project uh, process? Because I imagine in the earlier days, uh, big wasn't uh, as big as in, in size of people. So maybe Bjorke could be very, very involved in every single project. Um, how it, does it look like now? Because you have an office in Copenhagen, an office in Barcelona, an office in New York. Um, what is the creative process? Do... There is a design lead that comes up with the ideas and then the partners in charge review them or what is more or less the structure at big in that sense in the process of creating those cool projects you guys managed to do? You kind of answered it when you said earlier that, you know, we are so many partners where um, all the partners um, are stretched uh, throughout the different offices. And in a way, uh, I, I would say each of us complement uh, others. And, uh, and then collectively, we also complement and support Bjarke. Uh, and, and so it is uh, a process where, um, and, and then also to realize that we, we have had these milestones where I remember uh, Bjarke uh, really insisting on that it's not only an architecture office, but that we also, uh, you know, create a holistic design process that includes landscape, it includes planning, it includes engineering, and, and even down to the products. So this big leap idea of landscape engineering, architecture, and, and product design um, is, is really to, uh, in a way, uh, to deal with scale, uh, deal with complexity, um, and then to uh, get those resources and those uh, uh, specific skills uh, into the office. So, you know, the projects that you see behind me um, are representative of uh, many of those different subsets uh, kind of working together uh, to create sort of a holistic whole. And um, so the, the partners in each of the offices are very responsible for uh, the direction of these projects. Um, then, of course, we have uh, incredibly uh, talented and incredibly strong project leaders. Uh, when you start working on very complex projects, you need also a layer of project management uh, and being able to manage that process because it can go, you know, sometimes you start an architectural project and it can take 10 years uh, or longer to build. So, um, suddenly you realize that you're going to actually be retirement age before you actually finish a project. Um, and, and so you have to manage that, that process as well. Um, and, and, and then it's, you know, you are at the end of the day um, as strong as the, as the people. Um, and so I think by attracting really, really talented people, um, really curious people, um, that are continuously learning. Uh, that's how you get the best, um, the best results. And um, talking about, of course, making the great project, the great projects you guys manage to do. Need you need a great staff, a great team, with a lot of talent. Um, a lot of people that will listen to this or listening to this um, will 
and wonder people will be wondering uh, what is the what does it require to get uh, to be one of the big stars? So what is the what are I know I don't know maybe you're not directly involved into uh, acquisition of new people at the office, but is there a certain um, a certain quality or a certain talent that people have to have? Because also uh, sometimes when you go and visit um, the website of big or yeah you see all these great projects that are um very very high level you get a little bit intimidated so do you need only to be i don't know a great um computational designer or what other skill set can take you into big well i i actually happened to be um early on in those first years in copenhagen uh i was leading the the uh, selection of interns uh, that were coming into the office. And so I, I think it starts even at the level of the interns that you, um, that you invite in. Um, and, and some of those interns are now partners like Daniel Sundlin, uh, Joao Albuquerque, um, Hannah uh, Johansson uh, is an associate. Uh, other, uh, other associates as well came from that kind of internship class. So, I, I really feel um, that you have the ability uh, at every stage to, um, you know, to present. And if you were to sort of ask what is the, what, what is the kind of the perfect um, kind of profile, I, I would very much say it's someone that's a generalist and someone who is as interested in the history of architecture and can speak about their designs or speak about any other people's designs. Uh, it's about putting forward strong ideas. It's about representing those ideas uh, through different tools. Um, and, and, and then, you know, we spend a lot of time also building physical models. So uh, iterating and finding out through um, a lot of different uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, through a selective process, uh, which ideas uh, percolate to the top. So what, What really separates someone uh, from someone else is, I think, uh, tackling as many of those things as possible, always knowing that there's room to learn. Uh, the beauty of our profession is that you're continuously learning, even uh, you know, at my age and at Bjorka's age, where we're still adding a lot to, uh, to uh, how we work and how we, uh, how we uh, have the creative process. There are constantly new tools, Um, now in, with AI, both uh, the written word as well as the visual language is going through another iterative change. So, you know, you're, 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 you're never sort of standing still. And if that's your personality and you're open to that, I think that's the kind of um, person. Um, and, you know, again, being able to work in a team uh, and communicate clearly uh, are all um, really huge benefits to, uh, to being able to be successful in a, in a space like big. But what I also appreciate about, about big, um, and I've, I've done this myself, is, um, you know, we have, we're, we're a large office, but we continuously start new offices. And those new offices are almost like pioneering events where, you know, five or six bigsters are starting a new place in London or starting a new place in Barcelona. Uh, we just two years ago started one in Shenzhen. Uh, this year we're looking at Los Angeles. So you, you still have the ability, even in this organization, to uh, actually uh, kickstart and start something from scratch uh, where you're not only doing the design work, you might be you know, ordering paper and uh, making sure the lights stay on and figuring out where the office space is, um, And, and so, so you're able to work with a lot of synapses and, and, and use a lot of parts of your brain and your, and your uh, physical abilities to, uh, to start something. And I think that's what I've always found very, very exciting. Yeah, I guess that uh, once you're in, it gets easier. <laughs> But <laughs> it's like uh, landing the project, right? Before, I, after you landed the project, it's kind of easier. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm also curious, I, in itself, architecture, it's a very intensive uh, process. 
whether I mean at the basic level it's already intensive and doing it with this um, incredible shapes and corners and uh, buildings that you guys design it's probably way more requires way more um, working and also um, yeah you just there are some stuff that needs to get done it, architecture is not like reading a book and writing and I say it's a never ending process uh, creativity in general is like this um, is there also some ways that big tries to to check their the the, the work life balance of the people working at big uh, or are there some programs internally I don't know how does it work because imagine doing competitions and doing um, projects requires intensive work for several weeks or months um, do you have guys some ways of steam off or balancing the um, this this kind of things? Yeah, so uh, I think it's extremely important to create the the, the right uh, balance um, because you you can't stay in a you know purely productive uh, mode. All of us remember our own time in in school, uh, and we. Uh, there, there are many things to actually, I think, concentrate on. Um, part of that is uh, also the further kind of uh, growth opportunities for people. So, you, you know, we set aside time within each of the offices to, uh, to help people uh, learn new skills or to uh, teach each other skills. We call it big school. Uh, people that are bigsters that know something uh, then are you know are really encouraged to share it with uh, with others so that you don't just silo off something. Um, Ali uh, Thomas is a great example of this with the Archi, Archi Network, uh, where he's sharing all of the the tools and the secret sauce and everything from uh, his experience uh, with the larger uh, community. And and I think we encourage this not only for Ali. Uh, and, and to do it, uh, you know, uh, globally, but also we encourage it uh, with any of the, the bigsters and themselves. Um, you know that we also, uh, you know, really uh, take time to uh, create sort of off time uh, uh, kind of social events. Uh, we, every three years, uh, have historically gone on uh, study trips where, we take uh, anyone who wishes in the office uh, kind of on a subsidized trip to a different country and spend 10 days to, uh, to get to know the, the architectural culture. Um, and then I think it's really important also to uh, create a space for people to have families. Um, many of us uh, have newborns and, you know, the, the needs of, uh, of balancing a family life with a professional life is also very, very important. So, um, I think these are all things that, um, you know, really encourage people to take a better time off uh, and find the balance uh, to uh, uh, continuously learn and not to be uh, placed into a rut. Um, and to, and my hope is that Big is a place that is uh, that really is known for how much uh, you know people are valued and and also that. The, that, that there's a, a kind of investment in everyone uh, to be their very, very best. Yeah, and I think that there is a certain camaraderie created uh, in the office because also sometimes there are images on, on your social media where you guys party <laughs> like crazy and do all this, uh, I don't know, costume parties, burning mermaids <laughs> and stuff like that. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really interesting. And, and what is your, your current um, working day at Big look like? Because uh, also last time we met in Frankfurt, uh, you are constantly on this crazy schedule uh, between not only meetings, but between traveling continents and so on. Um, so how does your generally your days look like and what are your tasks? Is it still this hunting project or are you also hands on on some projects? Sure. So, I mean, it certainly with the opening of the Shenzhen office, uh, 
it now means that the sun never sets on uh, on any sort of big office. There's always an office open somewhere around the world. Um, and that, that, of course, means that there are always uh, decisions that need to be made and, and people that are, um, you know, expecting some input. So it's true that, you know, there are a, a few of us that work globally. I, I work globally between the offices, uh, and therefore I need to spend a little bit of time each day to, um, to, to look after all of those uh, different uh, needs. Uh, but for the most part, I would say, you know, for, for good 90% of the of, of Bigsters, they're, they're dealing with just the, the needs of uh, their office and of their, uh, their kind of region. And so um, I would say for the most part, um, you know, I may be the exception. Um, and I, I used to travel a lot more uh, pre-COVID than I do now. So I, I don't ever see returning back to uh, the way that it was because of, you know, being able to have and hold a conversation like this online uh, before it might have been in the studio of, of your, you know, of, of you and it would have been in person. And so I do see that there, that, that the post COVID world is really uh, allowing us a lot more uh, relaxedness and, um, and different tools and opportunities to, to create uh, uh, a less harried life of of being in airports and hotels and 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 uh, curtsing about, but that doesn't mean that you know by we we work in over forty different countries globally, um, and that you know doesn't mean that clients don't want to see you or you don't go on a site visit. Those those still have to happen, and if we are to work in as many uh, places in the future, we're still going to. Uh, we're still going to get around and and to to see and meet people. Um, that's again at the core of every project is that you understand uh, the needs and the challenges of of that very sort of local condition. Um, but I, I think we're gonna you know we're gonna continuously take advantage of of online and uh, in person tools uh, to to make that happen. No, definitely. That was a great. Actually, that was the moment where I decided to start this podcast because usually people would expect to meet in person, and then it's when it started being common to be more open to do something online. And and um, one question also is how do you, um, as an organization that it's now so big, um, it's so funny that the name is big and and everything around it. It's also like that. Um, to embrace these new tools, this constant innovation. Because I know that once you get big as an organization, it's very hard to move. Like you're getting like a giant, you know, you're not that agile uh, anymore. Um, do you have some internal team that it's only focused on testing all these new tools? Also, you mentioned before Oli, who I know personally, and um, and we became kind of friends through the podcast and everything. And so I know that also he works a lot on uh, innovative stuff in, in the realm of AR, VR, beam, computational yeah. design. So do you also have constantly some experimental teams in, in the office that are, are exploring what are the new things on the, on, in the world? Yeah. So you should know that I, I started watching the Creative Insider also during COVID. And I think like many of us, um, we were looking for new ways to uh, access information. And so when you started to post um, and... Uh, it was very interesting conversations. I started to listen. Um, so it, 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 I think, you know, that's where I, where I think that these shocks to the system, uh, like the pandemic, uh, really creates a lot of ripple effects uh, that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see in a few years when we look back, uh, were really, really important. Uh, you know, there's the negative side of COVID for sure, uh, but then out of that, there, there could, again, be some things that actually are, are quite positive uh, for, for the profession. Um, I think that, um, you know, we, another uh, kind of COVID-related story is just that uh, maybe about a month or two before the pandemic, 
our IT department had decided to install Teams uh, into each of our computers. And uh, we, we were always saying that there was no way for us to communicate effectively, um, you know, beyond our telephones uh, calling each other. And we were kind of wondering, it, was, it wasn't there some kind of virtual uh, uh, kind of means to have a conference call where we could also design and, and draw. And so our IT department uh, investigated these over a couple of months and they chose Teams. And so it was on everybody's computer, but no one had ever actually uh, tried it out uh, because it, there was no impetus to, right? There was no one that actually just said, let's, let's, let's have the next phone call on Teams. And so then the pandemic happened. And from one day to the next, we were from the office to our homes here in New York. And uh, we had a crash course, I remember, on the second day on how to use Teams. And, and we, now you can't even imagine, you know, our professional lives without uh, these virtual Zoom or Teams or, uh, or, or any other, um, you know, way of actually uh, holding these kind of uh, larger conversations. And I still think that they, they, they still have room for improvement. There, there could be a lot more visual tools that could be uh, connected to it. But just imagine if we didn't have those uh, digital tools, how much harder it would have been to create um, the, the spaces uh, for, for each other to do what we do. Uh, we discovered that the creative process is really hard to do virtually and in, in many different locations. So, you know, we insisted um, really on uh, bringing people back into the office and and, and being able to work together and help each other, uh, mentor each other. Um, and, and, you know, so it's, it's really, again, it's a balance of both uh, the physicality and being with each other um, and, and the humanity of that, uh, as well as taking advantage of the, the new technological tools. I, I agree with that. I agree that in the earlier phases of a project, especially when a creative process is going on where you need to exchange a lot of ideas and actually, as you said, sit together and it's very easy to sketch together, think together, um, you need this closeness. But I think that in further, um, in further phases of the project, when it's more about, I don't know, if you're in doing uh, construction documentation or if you are um, working closely, but with people that are not, um, um, you're not working really together with people that are with you anyways, because maybe you work with some consultant or maybe you work with somebody that's on the construction side. I think that then, then this flexibility might get a little bit looser and then you can you can also work remotely in my opinion and i think that certain offices get stay too rigid um and and i'll just answer your other technical technological question i think it's of course the tools of the trade for architects but i think we're just as interested in also uh how construction is changing and uh the whole uh kind of interest in 3d printing um, and, and what that means, uh, both for bringing the cost of construction down, um, as well as doing things like actually designing the first habitat on the moon, that you could actually, you know, think that kind of far out to, uh, to send up a printer and then use the, the regolith or the moon dust as your building material. Um, I think that's, again, um, a way for, uh, for architects to, uh, to future proof themselves. Yeah, that's also like the um, the the next thing will be exactly this uh, to work uh, <laughs> to work on on other planets uh, and uh, on the moon. Maybe someday we'll have uh, a big Mars or something like that. That would be <laughs> very interesting to see. Um, and it's very exciting to see your project, guys. I also read some. You had also your interview in detail in the magazine. Um, was super interesting to see and you also collaborate with the company Icon so um, very excited to see how this kind of technology is going to develop um, do you have a lot of um, do you have a, actually a lot of now to, to actually I want to ask one question about this um, space architecture because I'm curious 
because um, it's my thing. People might think that it's a lot of engineering. Um, do you have a lot of consultancy and together work together with space engineers to in order to figure out how to build these new designs? Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly is not something that you are born with. Um, and all of the rules that are in the Neufert uh, kind of uh, design guidelines, uh, you can just chuck out the window because you're in uh, zero gravity or near zero gravity uh, environments. So um, it, it is something that um, you have to realize there are some space agencies out there like NASA that have been designing capsules and rovers and uh, you know landing modules and they've been doing that for since the 50s and 60s so there is there are quite a lot of people that have dedicated their entire lives to designing in those kinds of environments um, what we then offer is uh, somewhat of a naivete coming at it uh, with a fresh set of eyes uh, but we also take that uh, role very seriously and uh, you know, partners like Jakob Lange in Copenhagen, uh, Martin Vöckle here in um, in New York, uh, Jason Wu, uh, an associate also here in um, and and um, you know they they all are working uh, quite uh, you know I, I would say very very much at sort of coming to the the essence of uh, what is important. Um, it perhaps is important to, uh, in some ways, simulate uh, the, the daylight and the nightlight uh, on Earth so that, you know, humans that are suddenly working in a lunar environment um, are, are still able to work with the sort of the cycles uh, that they're used to or have grown up with. Uh, it could also be that suddenly you, you have no, uh, nothing to sort of hold you to the ground, so suddenly the section becomes something that's quite, it can be twice or three times as high because you can reach the top shelf uh, on, on the second story uh, just as easily as the bottom shelf on the first story. So, you know, there, there are just different ways of sort of starting to think about space. And, and that, I think, is also uh, very, very uh, exciting when you start to have new uh, parameters uh, to design to. And, uh, and so we work very closely with uh, the NASA folks. Uh, there's also other specialist firms um, that we've also worked together with uh, on any of these uh, pursuits. No, it's very exciting indeed. Um, I'm looking forward to see what the, the outcomes um, of these designs and projects will be. Um, I would uh, start asking you a couple of questions from the audience. Um, so Luka Popovic uh, ask, is asking if um, you guys have a dedicated 3D visualization team within the offices or you rely on uh, external visualization companies when because all the all the stuff that comes out, uh, graphics from big are so beautiful. So um, that's one of the questions uh, was asked. Yeah, so thank you for the question. Um, it's actually the, 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 the honest answer is both. Um, we, we have visualization teams uh, that really specialize uh, and have that as their kind of primary skill. Uh, we all uh, hope to and, and, and are able to kind of create certain visualizations, uh, but then the sheer volume um, of, of work that has to be produced also limits us sometimes, and we, we use uh, and outsource uh, uh, working with, uh, with uh, others. Uh, it's funny, you know, we've been around now for, uh, I would say, 20 years, 20 years plus between plot and big, and so there have been a lot of people also that have been bigsters and then have uh, gone on to start their own companies. Uh, so some of the bigsters that have gone off uh, have also started visualization companies uh, like Bucharest Studio uh, is one uh, that we use. And, and so it, it's, 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 you know, you're still working with bigsters, uh, but just in a different uh, uh, facet. And um, uh over 2,000 people have actually worked at Big and have now uh, either started their own firms or are working in other firms. So 
it's a fairly large group of people uh, that have all uh, come uh, and, and worked with big in, in some form or fashion. Yeah, also so funny because the, the world is small, right? Because I got to <laughs> got to know the guys from Bucharest Studio through this podcast too. So um, yeah, I can imagine that working in such a innovative environment as big uh, will generate other companies like, for example, Rem Colas was for then the earlier generation. And then there is one question that is kind of related to this one um, from Apostolia. Mm, she asking if um, diagrams versus visualizations, which of the two has the potential to describe a best a concept to the clients? I guess um, also both. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that's a, it, it's really a good question in that who is your client? Is your client the one that's paying the bills or is your client... Uh, the citizens at large, um, because maybe a, maybe a public project actually is going through a public approvals process. Um, I think that there is a need for both. It's not an either or. Um, what diagrams uh, do is that they take uh, often very complex information uh, and they break it down so that it is... Um, it is uh, manageable. It is, uh, you know, you can basically... Uh, take them step by step and uh, and help them understand and break down uh, the essence uh, of a project. And so diagrams have always played a very important role, but uh, I think sometimes people think of the diagram as simplifying uh, projects, uh, which is not their intent. Their intent is really to communicate uh, quite complex, quite uh, uh you know, large amounts of information in a digestible sort of way. And, and I think that that is um, also when you peel all the layers back on, on any of these projects, um, there's a lot there. And uh, diagrams cannot communicate everything. Uh, they communicate sort of the larger brush strokes. Um, and, and then renderings, you know, in some way also don't tell everything. And that's why we also use models so much because models help to, uh, again, communicate space, uh, section, uh, building systems uh, in a way that, that rendering sometimes have a hard time to do or, or diagrams certainly don't do. So you got to use everything uh, at your, uh, at, you know, in your arsenal, in your quiver. And uh, we, we have another one. It's um, good quality architecture versus marketing. What of these two is the decisive factor of running a successful architecture firm in 2023? So if, um, because also guys, you are also very represented in many movies, in many, I mean, it's kind of become iconic through the Netflix show Abstract too. So what is... What is more important, architecture, great architecture, or also marketing? So again, we don't we don't use the word marketing. Uh, so I, I wouldn't actually say it's uh, that that we uh, move that way. I think you should always focus on uh, the work that you do, and and good architecture communicates. So um, I think first and foremost, that is what we aspire to do: is to make uh, really great architecture. Uh, very holistic architecture where, you know, uh, landscapes and the extension of buildings into the landscape are as thoughtful as the uh, spaces inside. Um, and, you know, that all of these things take time. Uh, they, they don't just happen overnight. So many of these uh, projects are years, uh, both in the conceptualization and in their, in their execution. Um, I think when, you know, one of the, I would say one of the uh, challenges of social media is that, you know, you're, you're trying to communicate years worth of work uh, in a few uh, short uh, photographs or in, in less than a paragraph of text. And I really encourage everybody, um, rather than believing everything that you see in social media, is to actually just go and see it, experience it. Uh, you know, make some sketches, uh, write a story or, or several paragraphs about what you've experienced. 
uh, that's how you really get to the essence of, of uh, a project. Yeah, and and we have one last one from the from the audience. Um, uh, apparently, there has been um, distributed information about uh, the the master blueprint for the planet uh, designed by Bjork Ingels. There is this sort of master plan for the whole planet or master blueprint. If you can briefly explain what is it and how can people contribute to it, maybe. Yeah, it's. Actually, uh, Bjarke has given a couple of talks. Um, if you, I think there, there was a recent one in Naples, Napoli, uh, and you can Google plan for the planet uh, and Bjarke and maybe Naples, uh, and you can see it there. It's a, a little bit over two hours uh, where Bjarke really delves into, um, we are at a point uh, where we are aware of the crisis uh, and of climate change. Uh, we also are at a point where uh, data is uh, accessible and we can actually quantify some of these, uh, these uh, needs, uh, both in terms of, you know, where the biggest uh, polluters are or where uh, you could make the biggest uh, changes. And, you know, with regards to actually knowing something, and also technologies that have uh, already been uh, approved and are incorporated, uh, making those technologies accessible to as many people as possible, uh, we can and should start to implement and to uh, share knowledge. So it's, a, it's really a knowledge sharing uh, kind of idea. Um, and, and the hopes uh, of it are in a way to create a little bit of a, perhaps a Wikipedia of, uh, of knowledge sharing at the scale of the planet. Uh, we have heard of, you know, plans for uh, a neighborhood, uh, maybe planning for a street, planning for a city, planning even for a region. Um, maybe what we should also be considering is the, the planning uh, for the planet so that when, you know, the sun shines in one part of the globe, uh, it could be producing energy in the part of the globe that is in darkness. Uh, when it's windy in one location, maybe that could help uh, the areas that have uh, no access to wind power. So just as you have uh, nat nat national energy grids, uh, maybe there's also a possible conversation about uh, sort of international uh, uh, alliances that would allow for uh, a more efficient use of our natural resources, uh, such as sunlight, uh, wind, air, wave, uh, motion. Uh, so it's, it's really a, a hope that with, with knowledge, uh, we can address the challenge. Yeah, that's, um, I think it's much needed for the future of our, of our planet. Uh, well, Kai, I know that you have a very tight schedule as usual, as I mentioned during the podcast. Um, so I want to thank you very much for, for the time you gave us to, to answer the questions because it's very nice and always it's um, a great pleasure to discover more of great companies like Big uh, from the people that are behind the scenes. And um, I always say this to every guest, you are um, the first time on the Creative Insider, but it doesn't have to be the last one. Uh, so you're always welcome back to to explain um, some news or also other partners. Uh, Bjorki itself, very welcome, everybody. And thank you very much for your time. And I wish you a great day. Thank you, Georgi. And uh, definitely, we're always interested to, uh, to uh, communicate with you. And it would be great if uh, some other bigsters could uh, speak in the future. I'm sure they will. Okay, have a great day. Bye. If you want to ask some questions to our guests too and have access to the live podcast or early access to the unedited and uncut podcast episodes, you can do that now by just joining our Patreon community. I'll leave you the link in the description of this video. If instead you just want to enjoy free videos here on YouTube, here is another one. And don't forget to like this episode, subscribe to the channel. That means the world and you're supporting the conversation about creativity and business. 
Thank you very much and see you with the next one.